Uh, hello and welcome to the next Future Leaders Group of Open UK's uh, lunchtime training session. Uh, a little bit about the Future Leaders Group and who we are. Uh, my name is Robert Grinnells and I am one of the co-chairs of the Future Leaders Group, along with Katie Gibson from Bristow's. And we're both lawyers advising on technology and commercial matters. Uh, the Future Leaders Group is a collection of individuals who are interested in open technologies, including open source software, open hardware and open data. It includes a wide range of people that work in technology, intellectual property, outsourcing, procurement, data, coding and innovation, as well as private practice lawyers and in-house counsel that work in the technology sector and related fields. We operate under the direction of the Open UK Legal and Policy Committee, and we have a purpose to bring together and develop future leaders in legal and policy matters relating to open technologies and support and further the mission of the Legal and Policy Committee. We're always open to new ideas and to new members, uh, whether we're getting involved in all our activities or just dipping in and out of our various projects. So get in touch with us if you'd like to join. And I'm delighted today to say that we're joined by Adam Jollins, the Programme Director of IBM Z and the Linux One Product Marketing and Red Hat and Linux IBM Systems Group Head. And uh, today, Adam will be talking about IBM's journey to open source. Uh, welcome, Adam, and thank you for joining us. OK, well, thanks very much, Robert. And I'm delighted to be here on the call today. Um, I wanted to share with you today uh, IBM's journey with open source. So let me just bring it up to um, yeah, uh, and what we've learned along that journey, uh, what we found was uh, unexpected, and uh, what we wish we'd known at the start. IBM has been involved with open source now for probably about 22 years, so quite a long time. Uh, it's gone in stages, and obviously with the recent um, acquisition of Red Hat, uh, there's a very much a renewed emphasis in terms of uh, open source within IBM. So if we start, um, it all started back in 1998 uh, with uh, the early days of web serving and uh, how do you provide an HTTP server to the market? And IBM had developed its own HTTP server and we thought it was pretty cool and it was good and it was good performance. Um, unfortunately, nobody was really using it. And so we sort of started looking around at the market and saw the activity that was going on in terms of uh, Apache HTTP server. Okay. Um, and uh, this was one of the, uh, the early of the open source projects. And this triggered a whole set of other sort of interests inside IBM in terms of um, uh, how should we get involved in open source? Should we get in open so involved in open source? What's our Linux strategy? What's our open source strategy? And this was at the time where there was an increasing interest uh, in open source in many other areas, whether it was inside IBM research and development, but also with the born on the web companies, uh, the, the, the new companies were very much using open source. So from an Apache point of view, we decided that uh, what made sense was that uh, uh, we stopped development of our own HTTP server and we put those resources into the open source community with Apache in terms of uh, contributing to and then leveraging the um, Apache HTTP server in our sort of um, uh, WebSphere application server. Now, this raised some questions, um, which the biggest one was, how do you successfully participate in an open source community? And we knew before going into this that uh, the way not to successfully participate in an open source community was to come in as the 600 pound gorilla and say, IBM is here, uh, this is what you should do. Okay. Um, so we spent some time actually sort of looking at what was the best way to actually sort of uh, work with open source communities and to understand how they worked. So IBM for a number of years had been on the proprietary software development line. Uh, we thought this was a really good uh, line that you went through a uh, sort of requirements gathering stage and you then moved on to the design stage and then you handed it on to the coders and then you handed it on to the testers and you had hundreds of programmers all sort of working to this. And this produced a number of really successful products, uh, but the world was changing. And so we were sort of looking at what was different here and how on earth could this, I think it's been likened to a bizarre uh, work compared to the cathedral of proprietary software design. We also asked the question of, well, what was the quality of open source code like? How on earth could uh, uh, code that was developed by people in there 
a sort of uh, uh, bedrooms or dorms at university? How could that be good, open, good sort of software quality? And we found out that actually it could be really, really good software quality. And that was a lot to do with the fact that uh, people were able to sort of experiment with it. You've got a lot of people using it. People were able to comment and they were able to suggest uh, enhancements back into the community. And so it was a community development rather than a hierarchical or single person development. We also um, looked at uh, uh, when and how should IBM participate in uh, open source communities. IBM has got something like 400,000 employees around the world. Uh, there's uh, millions of open source projects. So obviously you have to make a decision as to when do you participate, when do you not participate. And we decided we participate uh, Firstly, when we thought we had something to contribute, we had skills or experience or knowledge that could usefully be brought into it, and when it was helpful in terms of uh, uh, IBM's customers or whatever, so it sort of worked in terms of our, uh, our business. And perhaps one of the really important things we learned there was code is king. So if you're coming from a big enterprise company and working with a, a, an open source community, the common ground is programming, and uh, IBM programmers respect open source programmers, and open source programmers respect IBM programmers when they're producing good code. So participation in the open source communities meant writing code, it meant having people from IBM involved in the uh, open source communities, initially to learn about the projects, but then getting on to be co contributors, and beyond that to start uh, people being uh, uh, committers as well. We created something termed the Linux Technology Center as a hub for open source projects, uh, so a separate organization within IBM. And these were people who we as IBM paid salaries, we provided uh, their computers, their offices, their desks and chairs, but they were working on open source projects as part of the open source community. So it wasn't uh, um, sort of a, an IBM uh, takeover, it was very much an IBM participation in these open source projects. Okay. And what were the benefits that we were going to get? Well, we thought firstly we'd understand the software a lot better uh, by being active participants in the community. Uh, we could influence, uh, we couldn't direct because that's not what, how open source projects work. Uh, but we, by building up the knowledge and contributing, uh, we could actually start to influence the direction of some of these projects. And especially, uh, a good example here is we got involved with Linux, was how can we help Linux become enterprise ready, enterprise grade, so that our big customers would then be able to use it. And also it enabled us to sort of contribute uh, uh, patches that people could then uh, decide to include in the open source project or not including the open source projects. And of course, IBM is just one of many contributors to open source projects, and we, um, some of these get accepted and some of them don't. So community participation was key, one of the things we learned in this early experience of working with the Apache Foundation. So in 2000, uh, we uh, then went into, uh, uh, get involved in Linux um, in a much bigger way. So looking back 20 years, the IT market at that stage was dominated by proprietary operating systems, so Windows NT on the uh, x86 systems, uh, various versions of proprietary Unix, so Solaris, so HP UX, IBM AIX on uh, uh, proprietary Unix hardware, uh, IBM's mainframe with ZOS, uh, projects like uh, IBM's OS2, which was our alternative to uh, Windows at that stage, um, and a whole variety of operating systems there. But what was happening in the market was Linux was being adopted by um, sysadmins, by people in the back room for IT tasks for the research departments. This wasn't a top-down movement. It wasn't a sort of bank deciding that uh, uh, Linux should be used. It was people within the bank uh, at programming and uh, development level thinking, actually, we could uh, use Linux for this particular task. Uh, and it can make sense. And uh, if, for example, it was used for web server or used for DNS server, um, it wasn't, didn't particularly come to notice of the uh, executives 
uh, because it worked and it just worked and it was there and reliably running. So it wasn't a point of uh, sort of issue because it had crashed. But bit by bit, Linux became used for a lot of the edge functions and backroom functions. We saw an opportunity there for Linux to become an enterprise operating system. And within IBM, we have a number of different compute families with mainframes, with our power systems, with our AS400, our, our business application series with x86. And we thought there could be an opportunity for Linux to provide a unified operating system across IBM servers. And this would make it easier for us in terms of development, make it easier for our customers in terms of uh, adoption and integration. So within IBM, there was a, a lot of activity that went on uh, um, in terms of the hardware divisions, the software divisions, the services divisions. Uh, we, as I say, we created the Linux Technology Center. Uh, we hired Linux kernel programmers uh, to give us that knowledge and to enable us to sort of uh, uh, have credibility as we worked with uh, the open source communities. And then in uh, late 2000, uh, the then CEO of IBM, Lou Gerstner, uh, said that he was uh, announced that IBM was going to invest a billion dollars in Linux and uh, in various activities there, whether it was development or marketing or sales or documentation or getting our hardware to run it, but an overall investment of a billion dollars. And this this made quite a bit of quite a bit of news, and it was the first big commitment by one of the big IT vendors at that stage. We also uh, supported the promotion formation of the Open Source Development Lab. Uh, this then combined uh, with uh, another open source uh, foundation to become the Linux Foundation, which will be familiar to a lot of people. Uh, but we did this uh, along with a number of other IT leaders. So this was really the sort of the start of uh, Linux uh, in, inside IBM. So one of the questions that came up here uh, was, if the, oh, if, if the software is freely available, uh, how do you make money from it? Okay. And there's a whole variety of open source business models. So I think Amanda is going to be talking about these in more depth, these and others in more depth in a, uh, a couple of weeks' time. But we saw there that uh, there were a number of ways you could potentially make money around open source. And why do you want to make money around open source? Well, enables you to then invest development resource into uh, developing open source further. And from a, uh, um, a sort of individual programmer, uh, maybe in your time as a student or in your early 20s, uh, it's fun just to contribute to things for free. Uh, as you then sort of go into your 30s and 40s, um, you buy a house, uh, you have a family, you need to have a sort of a good income stream coming in so that you can follow your hobby in terms of open source. And so open source business models became really important. Here's some of the ones that we saw. Um, uh, Linux in its early days, um, uh, companies like Red Hat, like SUSE, like um, uh, Caldera, uh, Turbo Linux, um, did distributions of Linux. So rather than people having to download Linux from the internet themselves and actually build uh, and compile the actual operating system, you could have it packaged in shrink wrap and use that to install Linux. This made it a lot easier for people to use and get started. There's then introduced the service and support model. So enterprises wanted to know who could they call if they had a problem. They were running Linux and they had a problem. And the suggestion to uh, uh, call Linux, call Linux Torvalds, uh, wasn't a really practical one. And he didn't particularly answer his phone to questions like that. So the idea in terms of charging for service and support, and you would get the uh, bug fixes, you'd get the, uh, the patches for security, you'd get the next version, uh, became a popular way of going. And that's the way that, uh, for example, Red Hat with Red Hat Enterprise Linux, SUSE, the SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, um, uh, sort of have built their business model. Another approach is to offer two versions of the product, a free version that people can use and an enhanced version that uh, if you want the extra function, you can get. Um, this worked in some limited cases, but hasn't been as popular and isn't really seen as being a, a, a pure open source approach. Uh, one of the business models was competitive displacement. So if you were running um, Unix on expensive proprietary hardware and somebody came along with Linux running on x86 uh, commodity servers, then and were able to replace it, then uh, 
this was sort of obviously revenue to people bringing in Linux and also benefits to the customer by, by reducing the cost. The halo effect, uh, and this is one that IBM got involved with, is that if you're contributing actively to open source and you're seen as a big contributor in support of open source, then people will also consider you and may well buy uh, or prefer your hardware because of this halo effect, because you're seen to be contributing to Another approach is shared development costs. So this is sort of, a, uh, in a sense, a sort of a, a, a negative rather than a positive cost uh, uh, approach. But if you're going to develop a operating system uh, that runs across multiple hardware platforms, uh, that is able to do all the way from a laptop to running supercomputers, then it's actually easier to share the development costs with other companies rather than to have all the, uh, the development costs yourself. So a lot of the collaborations, one of the benefits they get is they're sharing development costs with other companies and therefore they're reducing their costs, which then is a good business model. It also includes in products, uh, a lot of things with the Apache and similar licenses are then included in bigger products, but you also see Linux included in uh, mobile phones, um, you see it included in uh, uh, set-top boxes and so on. And finally, and this isn't as, as big as it once was, uh, with the Linux um, uh, logo and uh, icon uh, being a penguin, uh, there was at one stage quite a market for cuddly toys. So different ways of making models from free software, these are continuing to evolve, but um, this enabled open source to really sort of grow and develop. So the next stage we did inside IBM was a project called Eclipse and people will be familiar with the Eclipse Foundation and the activities that they're doing in terms of uh, various open source projects. The background was that at this stage, the uh, IT development market was really dominated by, by Windows. Uh, there was a lot of Java development happening, but it was fragmented with multiple offerings against a single offering from uh, Microsoft for Windows. And we had uh, recently acquired and developed a good Java uh, integrated development environment. Uh, but very few people were, lowering it, were buying it. And so we saw a market opportunity here um, to establish a, a common Java IDE. And so we decided we were actually going to open source uh, the Java IDE code and call it uh, Eclipse. Okay. Um, and people could then take it, they could sort of use it for free, they could uh, build other products on top of it, they could, um, this development of the ecosystem for uh, Eclipse was really uh, very important because uh, it gave the opportunity for business models and people to sort of develop and use a number of um, contexts. Um, the Independent Eclipse Foundation um, was also a really important part for this to go from a IBM has donated this code or contributed this code to this is an independent open source foundation. And we found, and this is one of the learning points for us, was in the early days, um, uh, people from other big companies weren't so interested in getting involved in IBM's open source project. But when we turned it into an independent open source project, which IBM and other uh, big companies could participate and collaborate in, it was much more successful. Okay. And we've seen this play out again and again, uh, that um, open source, new open source projects are often far more successful if they're set up with proper governance and that governance being open. And a really good example recently is Kubernetes, which was originally developed by uh, Google, and then it was open sourced and a, a foundation, developed the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and so on, and it really has, has taken off with a number of companies since then. We also, as IBM, leveraged what was called the Eclipse Rich Cloud Platform, which uh, was a way of developing um, a uh, sort of a laptop um, application um, that ran across Windows and Mac and uh, Linux. Okay. Um, and this was very useful to us with uh, our IBM Notes email system, uh, but it's sort of been used in other contexts and shows the things that the unexpected things that then happen uh, with these sort of projects. So in terms of code contributions to open source and the question of how, how do you successfully open source a product, here's some of the things we've learned. Uh, and in a sense, it's what you learn not to do as well. So it's, uh, we learned not to do it as an IBM-dominated uh, foundation. 
you need to think about who owns the code. You need to think about how do you make sure the quality of the code is good. There's interest in the market, so you can open source something, uh, but if nobody else joins in with the project, then there's no value in terms of doing that. And it needs to provide differentiated function. It needs to sort of uh, provide something beyond what's already been provided in the market, so it's meeting a need. The choice of open source license becomes uh, important. Obviously, there's the uh, GPL license, uh, which is used for Linux and a number of other projects. There's the Apache and other uh, sort of uh, permissive licenses which are used. And I'm sure you've had uh, uh, various um, um, uh, uh, future leaders' lectures on the various open source licenses. But that's a key consideration you want to think about as you open source a project. You also need to build a community of contributors, and that's key in terms of the longevity of open source projects. Okay. If it's a big project, um, what's the governance? What uh, foundation are you setting up? Or is it something to be sort of set up as part of one of the Linux Foundation projects, or the Eclipse Foundation projects, or the Apache fan, uh, Foundation projects? And also, what's the business model? How is this going to actually become self-sustaining? So a lot of things we learned from an open sourcing Eclipse are uh, uh, in terms of other sort of open source projects. Now one of the other ones that came along, and this is uh, it's been a very big project, uh, was OpenStack. Uh, as cloud established itself much more uh, and infrastructure as a service became important, uh, it became dominated and uh, actually very much is still dominated by um, Amazon, VMware, Microsoft. Um, Google uh, and so on uh, in terms of cloud. And uh, one of the challenges there was that it was a different way of developing applications on each of these. So you couldn't actually move applications around um, or move infrastructure around uh, easily. There was growing interest in terms of uh, having an open source infrastructure as a service. Uh, OpenStack was one of those. Uh, things like CloudStack, Eucalyptus whole set of them, and in the end, it was OpenStack that became the leading open source infrastructure as a service project. Uh, this initially developed and led by Rackspace and NASA, um, and uh, we thought this was a good approach from an IBM point of view. So uh, rather than open sourcing what we were doing inside IBM, we thought actually we'll join this effort and we'll contribute our OpenStack programmers to through the Linux Technology Center. Okay? Um, will actually support the, the, the co-formation of an OpenStack foundation. And we'll say that in terms of what we do around cloud software, uh, it'll be open source based. So how do you successfully build a new open source community? Okay, what did people who were doing OpenStack? And this was, OpenStack were, was the biggest thing really in the open source market that had happened since Linux. So this was really actually a, a, a sort of a, a key time in terms of open source. So key considerations. Firstly, it needs to be a level playing field for all the participants. So if there's sort of a, a one company dominating it or a couple of companies dominating it and everyone else is sort of allowed to play but can't really make the big decisions, then you aren't going to get people joining and building that open source community. You need to have a level playing field. You need to have broad community and vendor participation. So in the run up to sort of uh, establishing the foundation, you have to do a lot of work in terms of getting other people on board um, so that when you announce it, it seemed to be uh, a lot of companies involved there and individuals involved there. It needs strong technical leadership. Uh, often that will come from people who originally wrote it, but it needs to have a, that strong technical leadership. Go back to code is king here. And it needs to have really good conf governance and an independent foundation. And then it needs to actually sort of uh, get itself known in the marketplace, it needs to educate people about it. So that's where the conferences and the education comes in. Uh, and uh, it needs to have the market adoption and get that momentum in the marketplace. And one of the things that will really sort of play well there is to have customer references. People, uh, companies say, we're using this open source project uh, for these reasons, because if you're a bank, one of the questions that you ask is, what other banks are using it, and why are they using it, and what's their experience been? And there's also a role for marketing here um, uh, in terms of promoting the project uh, um, and, and sort of uh, showing that, highlighting the successes, uh, and that helps to build the open source community. 
So another interesting open source project, and this is different in a number of ways, um, we did was something called Open Power. So Power was one of IBM's uh, proprietary uh, processor architectures. It's a risk architecture. It's been was uh, started in the mid 1980s and was used as the basis for um, uh, our Unix systems. Okay, um, and we had a, a sort of a the, the power sort of microprocessor. We were designing the processors. Um, but obviously, Intel and x86 were dominating the microprocessor market. Now, because of what it had been used for in terms of Unix workstations, supercomputers, things like that, uh, the IBM's power processors were significantly more powerful uh, than uh, the x86 systems, but it was only really being used by IBM for uh, our own servers, and that was fairly low market share. So how do you make this sustainable? And we uh, talk, had a number of discussions uh, with other companies out in the marketplace. We especially talked with the hyperscale data centers on their requirements and got back a number of really good feedback in terms of these are the things that would actually make it uh, a sort of project that we consider getting involved with. So first of them is the whole uh, big engine and little engine support. Um, and this is around uh, how do you order the bytes within a, a sort of a, a, a sort of memory and on the disk and so on. And there are two approaches. So big engine was used for IBM's mainframes. It was used for power. Uh, little engine was used for x86. And the hyperscale data center provider said, if they're going to make this work, you're going to have to remove this problem between big engine and little engine by adding little engine support to power the processor architecture. So we did that with the next version of the power processor. They also said you need to license the microprocessor technology to partners. You need to enable other people to build um, uh, servers based on uh, the power architecture. You need to open source firmware. You need to open source system software. So we did that, and we also set up an independent Open Power Foundation, initially with five members, you see, including people like uh, Google and NVIDIA, and now has well over 100 members in terms of open sourcing the hardware as well. And there's a number of other projects that have gone on in terms of open sourcing hardware. So this brings to question in terms of uh, what about open source beyond software? Can the principles of open source, of community collaboration, uh, deliver uh, value beyond software? And there's a whole area, and there's been a lot of success in a number of areas here. Uh, we talk, I talked about open hardware for open power, but open knowledge, a uh, really good example there is Wikipedia, where people collaborate to uh, provide and share the knowledge, and there's review processes. Uh, and the result of this is a much bigger and more up-to-date um, encyclopedia than anything that's been provided with books. Open education, can you share the, uh, um, uh, the tutorials, uh, the lesson plans, the lectures? Open data, which I know is a, a sort of area that uh, um, the um, Open UK has got involved with. Um, open collaboration, and actually in one sense, open collaboration uh, is a very old approach. Uh, because it's the pro approach that universities use in terms of research. So uh, in an area, if, for example, if you're into uh, quantum mechanics and physics, the way that sort of evolved was that somebody had a bright idea and then they published a paper around it so other people could sort of look at it and share that knowledge. And then somebody else had a bright idea that built on top of that and that then published another paper. And so you had all this collaboration uh, in the university model, uh, and it's really bringing that back into the software and hardware development models. An open government in terms of uh, data being uh, sort of easily available, readily available, so that people can do their own sort of uh, projects based on top of it. So the answer in terms of can the principles of open source deliver value beyond software is, is very much a resounding yes. But the whole idea in terms of communities, in terms of collaboration, in terms of government, in terms of business models, uh, apply in these areas as well. So lots more open source projects. And, and really during the um, sort of the uh, 2010 onwards, we saw a, a lot of open source projects beyond Linux come out. 
uh, and I mean, there'll be things familiar to you, Hadoop, in terms of how do you sort of do massive search in terms of documents, uh, KVM in terms of open source virtualization, Node.js in terms of uh, server-side development, Spark in terms of uh, sort of a bit, uh, intelligence and analytics, Kubernetes in terms of how do you manage containers uh, across multiple clusters. Um, and uh, open innovation becoming increasingly important. And in the early days of open source and the early days of Linux, uh, the open source projects were the cheaper way of doing something. This was the low cost way of doing Unix. This was the low cost way of, uh, of sort of developing software. But what we've seen uh, is that it's no longer just the low cost for, uh, system, it's where the innovation has happening. So a lot of uh, innovation, the majority of the innovation now is happening in a collaborative way. We've seen, we see, see this with containers and Kubernetes and cloud native development, uh, see this in terms of uh, uh, big data, Hadoop and Spark. Uh, and so on, that uh, uh, collaborative innovation and open innovation is becoming the default way of doing things. And the new companies, uh, the Googles, Facebook, the Twitters, the Amazons, um, uh, are using open source as the platform that they build their IT on. Okay? And then the existing companies are then sort of seeing this and sort of saying, okay, this is a, we're really interested. So banks have adopted open source, uh, um, governments have adopted open source and so on. From an IBM point of view, uh, we've had something like, uh, uh, this, and this is pre-Red Hat, uh, over 500 IBM programmers and engineers working on open source projects. Uh, we make deliberate decisions in terms of, should we get involved in an open source project? Can we add value to this? Um, are we going to sort of be able to provide benefits to our customers through what we're doing here? And is this sustainable? We do uh, a lot of support through that, through open source conferences, events, speaking of those, through supporting the independent foundations like the Linux Foundation, uh, and adding in collaborative projects. So uh, we did stuff around open virtualization with KVM inside the Linux Foundation. We've had, got a project around an open mainframe project. How do we modernize the, the, uh, uh, the mainframe with open source front ends? So, one of the questions that came up here was how do we, how does a big organization like IBM manage its open source activities? Uh, and what you don't want is a free for all, uh, because there's a lot of things you need to know in terms of uh, getting involved in open source. There's all sorts of legal issues you need to go through, stuff around patents, stuff around licenses. Uh, you don't want to lay yourself open to uh, uh, the potential of lawsuits and so on. So. We established an open source project office, and certainly for uh, any big company doing a lot around open source or using a lot of open source, we'd recommend doing this. And it can lay down guidelines around use of open source software, access to open source code, participation in open source development. So if you have your employees participate in an open source project, uh, it may limit your ability to do other projects in the future, so you need to bear all this in mind and having regular open source education. The Linux Technology Center, um, and this was a sort of a, a hub for programmers and engineers working on open source projects. And a lot of the questions that open source programmers have are, are different to proprietary programmers, but they're common with other open source projects and open source developers. So by having a hub, we were able to sort of share those, that experience, share that knowledge. And then in terms of strategy, <coughs> uh, open source market opportunities, where should we invest? What are the things that make sense? Where is the market going and so on? And having that centralized as well made a lot of sense. And that really leads on to um, the biggest uh, involvement of IBM in terms of open source, which was the acquisition last year of Red Hat. Okay. Uh, and this was a, a big acquisition. It was something like $34 billion. So uh, it was the biggest acquisition IBM has ever done. It was one of the biggest corporate acquisitions and certainly the biggest acquisition in terms of open source. And so why did we do this? Why do we think it made sense to bring together Red Hat and IBM uh, in terms of uh, uh, companies? <coughs> 
background to this was that um, public cloud growing, private cloud growing, um, gaining momentum, uh, but there was a real challenge in terms of how do you develop employ applications across clouds. There were, there's the ability to develop applications uh, on one cloud, so you could develop for Amazon, or you could develop for Google, or develop for uh, uh, Microsoft Azure, but if you then wanted to move to another cloud or do development in another cloud for another part of your business, um, these weren't, there weren't the, the compatibilities. The applications weren't easily portable across, uh, across clouds. Okay. Um, and uh, also, um, it was clear that not everything was going to go to the public cloud. So there were things like security, um, that meant that uh, some data would need to remain on premise or would need to remain within uh, a, a particular country because it was um, citizen data and couldn't be exported out there. So there were some reasons why stuff, some stuff would have to remain on premises, but you wanted to actually bring the ability to develop the applications uh, using that data in the same way as applications using data in the, the public cloud. And so, what has been termed hybrid cloud started to emerge as the, the leading infrastructure model, the leading model for platform as a service going forward, of being able to develop applications once and then easily able to have them available to run on a number of different public clouds, on private clouds, and on-prem. And the infrastructure for this was uh, Linux containers and Kubernetes. Uh, really became the, the, the leading application approach, and a number of companies started to harden this and develop um, um, uh, platform as a service that were using containers and Kubernetes. And Red Hat OpenShift uh, was very much emerging as the leading or leading enterprise Kubernetes platform. There are others, obviously, in there, and uh, uh, there's very sort of um, analyst reports in terms of. Uh, uh, how these are sort of developing, uh, but OpenShift, we saw technologically, we thought this was really good technology, uh, it had momentum in the marketplace, um, and this was one of the key reasons by, for uh, IBM's acquisition of Red Hat, was to be able to um, work with OpenShift and to pour petrol on the fire, which is an approach that we've had, sort of had with a number of uh, open source projects is by bringing the IBM sort of skills and experience and reach and knowledge, we can actually help accelerate uh, sort of development of open source uh, projects. We've been partnering with uh, Red Hat uh, for 20 years. Uh, we originally had, had some stock investment in them, okay? um, but it was really important as we sort of looked at this um, that Red Hat continued to be seen as independent and agnostic. So even though IBM has bought Red Hat, Red Hat is still working with uh, Microsoft Azure and with uh, Amazon and with Google Cloud and with uh, all sorts of other sort of cloud providers in terms of OpenShift being available on there and Red Hat Linux being available and, and so on. Um, and Red Hat is an independent operating unit uh, continues to be that within IBM, and that's really important in terms of the value of, uh, of, of Red Hat for us. We also saw it's uh, important to preserve the culture of Red Hat. So Red Hat is a 100% uh, um, open source uh, company. It has a, a number of differences in the way it operates um, and approaches things to IBM. Okay, and we thought, again, that's really important to preserve. Okay. What could IBM bring to the party? Well, we have the reach in terms of the number of uh, uh, businesses we work with, in terms of the number of countries we operate in. The industry expertise is very important in terms of uh, our work with banks and governments and retail organizations and, and so on. And we thought that could complement the Red Hat value. So as you all know, uh, the acquisition closed in the, the middle of 2019, uh, and then there's been various developments on from there, and uh, the, um, the CEO of Red Hat, uh, Jim Whitehurst, has now moved across into our IBM as the uh, president of IBM, so he's now the number two in terms of IBM, uh, and he has uh, the connection point also back into Red Hat in terms of what the Red Hat are providing in terms of OpenShift and Linux, uh, and um, um, uh, other projects within there. So it comes to another sort of question here of um, uh, can open source survive and thrive in the big business world? 
Okay. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of uh, people in open source who want to be uh, independent and uh, um, and so on, and that's good, whichever. But there's a, this opportunity for open source to be a really key part of the business world. But there's some things that uh, we really need to get right in order for this to work. First is that business needs to understand open source, needs to understand the different approach in terms of the development model, the whole community approach, the collaboration, uh, the different business models there, uh, and uh, the fact that it's where a lot of the innovation is now happening and the fact that it continues to grow as the software development model. Open source needs a sustainable business model uh, if it's going to have long-term success and be able to pay the people who are then doing the development. Community licensing, whether it's GPL or uh, Apache or the various other um, uh, licenses that are available, is important. Uh, but the contribution and collaboration in communities uh, are essential. And the whole open source culture and the way it's been approached in terms of um, uh, this is something we think we need to, to sort of fix. We'll provide the code. We'll work with you on this. The whole culture of open source is key, uh, and that needs to continue in terms of a successful collaboration between open source and big business. Which brings me to my sort of final slide, um, and this is just some of the projects we've got involved with from a, uh, an IBM port point of view in terms of open source, and there's many more. Uh, but coming back to the um, um, so the quote at the top of the page, and this comes from um, uh, Isaac Newton, who uh, uh, obviously sort of did a, uh, the original theories around gravitation uh, and did a lot of the work in terms of uh, calculus, in terms of mathematics. And he said that uh, uh, if I've seen further uh, than other people, it's because I've been standing on the shoulders of giants. I've been sort of building on top of what other people, what other bright people have developed before, and able to um, sort of uh, then sort of uh, uh, do the next stage in terms of the development. And one of the th interesting things uh, that, uh, uh, in terms of open source and the value of open source, and it's uh, um, is the realization that however big your company is, there's more bright people outside your company than inside your company. I think that's a good place to sort of finish on in terms of the value of open source and the value of um, open collaboration and why we as IBM uh, have seen it uh, as a sort of something we needed to get involved with and contribute to. Okay, so let me sort of hand back to uh, uh, the, the sort of moderators and see if there's any sort of comments or, or questions. Thank you so much, Adam. That was, that was really, really interesting. Um, I think my question is slightly um kind of picking up mainly on your your slides towards the end around what do you actually think is the biggest challenge that you face perhaps in your role or generally around open source and um, you picked up around the point that culture is key and that approach as well do you think that's a kind of still a big concern or do you think that kind of education there's so much education now around open source that actually that's getting better I think it's, it's it continues to be really key. I think it's especially key for the people who haven't grown up with open source. So if you've got people who come up through university and they've used open source of university and understand it, and then they go into a, a company like Red Hat or SUSE or uh, Google or whatever, um, then they get open source and they get the things you need to very carefully protect within there and the real importance of open source uh, collaboration and community. If it's people who didn't grow up with open source, then there's a really big education that needs to be done there in terms of understanding the value of it and the fact that open source is now the, the sort of majority way in terms of developing software. Um, there's still going to be proprietary source in the model or whatever, but open source is really key there. So I think it, it's, there's a generational thing there. Uh, I think it's going to it's going to get better over time, whatever, as we get more and more people coming up through it. And, uh, and uh, the use of open source in universities, whatever, I think is really yeah. encouraging, whatever. And it's uh, from a university point of view, it means that you can sort of talk about something, people can go in, have a hack of the code, change it, recompile it, and then when they come out of university into uh, the IT market, they have really useful skills that are useful there, as well as what they learned in university. That's really interesting. Thank you. Bob, did you have any 
Uh, yeah, no, I've got a couple of questions. It's interesting you say that that sort of tension still is kind of still there. It's kind of the, that you still need that education and the kind of not quite the message hasn't sunk in yet, but it's still kind of a thing that is still you have to talk about, you have to explain, and there's still all this information that people need to get to understand it. But uh, yeah, no, it's very interesting. Oh, I, I said a few, a couple of comments. Uh, I particularly enjoyed how you said that cuddly toys were a, a, a very good <laughs> business model. It, it's true. I mean, it's one of the things you see in the open source community, isn't it? You see, there's always a, a tux somewhere or a sticker yes. or some of that stuff or something. <laughs> yeah, and they would say um, in the early days, Susa certainly did a uh, sort of three or four foot high version of the tux, which they retailed for a couple of hundred dollars. So you can see at that stage, you start to get a business model appear in your daily routine. <laughs> No, definitely. Yeah. No, I think it's really interesting to see just how much support actually there's been from IBM over time and sort of both the scale of the support you're actually giving to the open source community, but also that it has been over a very long time um, and you really value that development um, model. And, it, and it's, it's, it's the thing, it's supporting these highly, like enormous, pro highly profitable companies. It uh, sort of shows that how actually open source is really a powerful thing. Um, I think it's interesting you were talking about there about the sort of later things of sort of right ones run anywhere. It's one of the things that I think uh, like it come from Sun originally, didn't it, into the Java system, and you were saying yes, like IBM yeah. Notes and Eclipse and stuff. And um, it's been around for years, but it hasn't really kind of sunk in quite fully until now. You've got now got Kubernetes and everyone going, oh, containerize everything, you can run it anywhere. Um, I think it's really interesting now that's sort of really started to get traction, um, yeah. So yeah, I think one thing I'd like to ask you as well, it's like you said about power, the power architecture, it's um, like there's been so much, uh, Open software has been kind of very much the kind of poster boy for the open source and open movement generally. Why do you think that perhaps power hasn't quite had that same traction and that, that sort of processes as a whole still kind of stick to uh, sort of Intel x86, the license model, and perhaps now with ARM as well being a kind of very powerful um, uh, system on a chip as well? Yeah, I think part of it is that it's really um, expensive to develop a new microprocessor. Mm. So the the investment in that is huge, Deborah, and then in terms of uh, sort of uh, the production, Deborah, the the cost of fabrication of setting up the fab plants is is huge, whatever. So it's it's difficult for people to get in and start. Now the interesting player in this place is um, ARM, Deborah, mm. who uh, come from a, a sort of being a sort of a, a, a British research company or development company around a, a, an early sort of um, pre PC system, Deborah, the, yes. uh, the BBC Micro, okay? yeah. uh, and then they, they developed. I remember using them at school. So. <laughs> no, yeah, and it, it's it, that was really one of the things that accelerated our sort of IT and, and computer science. It's probably a, another discussion that we could usually have there. Um, but yeah, the, their new processor, the ARM processor, which then got picked up because it was low power by mobile phones in the early stages, whatever, and is now the, 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 the sort of the, uh, the, the default and the dominant player in so both mobile phones and tablets, uh, and has the potential to go for, further. And obviously, there's sort of another sort of change of ownership happening in ARM, which could, could potentially accelerate further, whatever. So I think we're going to a more heterogeneous world. Um, in a couple of ways. Firstly, it's, um, it's not just x86, but it's x86 plus ARM plus some other people. Mm -hmm. And secondly, with the, the sort of containers and Kubernetes, we're getting the ability for software to run across different hardware platforms. Okay. Yes. Um, with uh, the, the fact you're building the dependencies inside the container makes it easier, whatever. Now, it, we're not all the way there yet. Uh, but the holy grail is, is that you've got an application that the, this application, this sort of containerized application, can run on any hardware because all the, the infrastructure has been sort of done mm. underneath it with Linux and with uh, Kubernetes and so on. Okay? And therefore, you as a customer can make the decision in terms of where do you run it based on the sort of uh, quality of service you need. Sort of. So based on do you, do you need high level security or do you need a really low cost or do you need this to be horizontally scalable or do you need this to be a, a sort of a, um, uh, a sort of supercomputer? Okay. Mm -hmm. And at that stage, right, I think that's going to accelerate the other different chips in the market, whatever, because you're able to sort of say same, same application uh, but you want the, the, this, this special hardware. Now, where power has been especially successful is in terms of supercomputers. Mm. Uh, so the, the, I think the top two supercomputers at the moment are running power chips, and, uh, uh, and that's because it's got this, this really high level of performance. 
Um, as AI comes in, we sort of see another potential there. But uh, um, there, there's there's potentials, but I think it's the the heterogeneity heterogeneity right um, of the market is is going to be really important, and also the fact that you can the applications through containerization are becoming more portable. That's that's really interesting. Saying that you need to get the applications portable, and then the, the hardware will follow, kind of thing, because you can find the right hardware that works for your kind of. You can you can optimize you can optimize yes, yeah. to the hardware. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah no, very interesting. No, thank you. That's that was really really interesting. I'll hand back to Katie. <laughs> Um, I think I just had one final question was whether you had any thoughts on whether you think actually uptake and approach to open source might actually change over the last six months with COVID, uh, with the various projects going on around the world, um, looking at ventilators. Um, do you think that actually it could have accelerated the uptake of open source and that people will actually start seeing the value in the collaborative projects that uh, yes, yes, happen? I think so. And I, th I mean, I think the... Um, the whole COVID tragedy, or whatever, in the situation, uh, has accelerated digital transformation. Whatever. So we've we, we've seen that people who people ha had hardly heard of Zoom before, right? Now everybody is using Zoom or WebEx or Blue Jeans or, or, or whatever, whatever. Um, so that's happening. There's the, the the collaboration tools sort of becoming much more popular. Um, I, I think that. There's still some way to go in terms of open source, in terms of people knowing about it. So, in terms of the higher reaches of government, people probably didn't know about the open source approach. But it's a common problem, right? That we as a sort of a, we as sort of a, a world need to solve. Whatever. And yeah, the fact that you can open source designs, whatever you can sort of reuse designs, I think is a, is important. And also, then you look in terms of um, uh, the collaboration, in terms of the sort of drug discovery, things like that, bringing supercomputers to be able to be used in terms of that drug, drug discovery. Uh, and then the next wave beyond that, I mean, if you, you look out in terms of, um, and this is another thing that uh, could be a really good topic into the future, okay, um, the next big, big, big wave of computing that's going to come through is quantum computing. Okay, which is a, a totally different way of doing things and is mind boggling in terms of sort of trying to understand it, but it has so much potential in terms of some specific, some algorithms, some sort of challenges there. Okay, uh, and that needs to, the, that's a lot of the stuff doing done on that is in terms of open source toolkits, whatever, for quantum right from the start so that people can, can use it and sort of, uh, again, stand on the shoulders of the giants. Interesting, thank you. I think, Ms. Rob, do you have any other questions? Uh, no, nothing else for me, but just no, that. Thank you. <laughs> no, yeah, well, thank you so much again, Adam. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and, yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to sort of, uh, uh, sort of doing more uh, sort of collaboration with, uh, with Open UK. Thank you so much again. Yeah, particularly on this rainy Friday lunchtime. Uh, next week, we have got Amanda talking about commercial models in using open source. So hopefully people will join us then. So thank you very much again, Adam, and hopefully see people next week. Thanks very much. Thanks. Bye.